He will hold me fast. What a beautiful thought that is. A thought that should give us great comfort. And, and the wonder of that is that he never lets us go. No matter what we do. That's just a beautiful mystery to contemplate. And I trust that you understand that the reason he holds you fast isn't because of you, but because of what he has done. And he's able to do that. He's able to hold you. And he's able to keep you through all of life's trials and tribulations. And into the future, too. That's the promise that we found this morning in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. That picture, the symbolism of the temple and the Ark of the Covenant. All of that pointing to the fact that we have been held and will continue to be held forever and ever and ever and ever. And on it goes. It never, ever ends. I trust that's something that you can say amen to uh, this morning as you contemplate the magnitude and the wonder of that. The importance of those types of truths are the things that the church has been tasked with teaching and communicating and making certain that the redeemed of Christ who are called to assemble together in churches like this are being taught these things that you are being exposed to these significant truths and that you're understanding why it is that he can and does hold you fast and why it is that he will continue to hold you fast and that we need to be careful about those who would teach us otherwise and give us pause in contemplating the fact that Christ can hold us fast and does hold us fast. And indeed, this is the very issue that John is dealing with in 3 John. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to 3 John. as we continue our study of this important little book, the last book written in the canon of the New Testament, the shortest, but it contains a powerful punch. A significant book that teaches us the true meaning of what Christian hospitality looks like, the importance of the truth and how hospitality is connected to the promulgation of the truth the problem with those who stand in the way of the promulgation and the presentation of the church, truth through the church and the commendation of those who stand in regards to making certain that happens through their time, through their resources, committing themselves to those things. Let's pray and then we'll read Third John. Lord, we love you. We thank you as we have just sung about that we are held fast by and through the finished work of Jesus Christ. On the cross, you cried out, it is finished. And in that moment, we were secured and we were kept and are being kept because of all that you have done. It indeed was finished. There is nothing else to do. I cannot add anything to it. No one in this room can. Even if we could, it would be inadequate because of all the things that Christ has already done. His act of obedience, his fulfillment of the law, his keeping of all those things for me, for us, the redeemed of Christ. How glorious a truth that is. May our hearts revel in it. May we contemplate this morning here together, assembled as the saints here in Beloit, Ohio. May our hearts be refreshed and rejuvenated and our joy be complete and assured as we think about all that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father for so great a salvation. Thank you for keeping us, preserving us, watching over us, securing us, giving us things to look at so we can better understand all that we have in Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word today. Give us a keenness and a sense of, of, of thinking clearly about things. Bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. May he illuminate our hearts may he cause us to have a zeal according to knowledge and may we then rest in the words of truth that we read and study this morning that you have so graciously given to us we are mar we marvel we are overwhelmed by the fact that a letter written some 2000 years ago is here open in our laps this morning for us to read for us to be blessed by for us to understand this is by your hand 
This is according to your good providence. So we rejoice, we give you thanks for that. We praise you for this day. Bless and keep us, we pray. Cause us to be attentive in Christ's name. Amen. Third John, beginning with verse 1. A passage now that's becoming quite familiar to us, I'm certain. The elder of, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. The word truth occurs six times in this short little epistle. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, that is, for Jesus Christ, that's what that means, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men. This is the passage that we looked at last week, in particular, latter half of verse 8. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Well, we've been taking the time to unpackage the significance of this little epistle and what we have been doing for a significant period of time is has been focused on understanding the meaning of the word truth and we understand the meaning of the word truth to speak to the gospel and the ethics that are contained in scripture the canon of scripture you will the content of scripture the teachings of christ and his apostles his instructions to the church and to the redeemed as it relates to their behavior in the world and relationships with each other and for John, the truth is very significant because the truth is necessarily tied to Jesus Christ. Christ himself would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so John wants to make certain that that is understood and that for the church, that it's being guarded as the repository of the truth. Ultimately, this epistle, although it contains these characters, is really about the priority and the purpose of the church as a repository and defender of the truth. John's instructions here are ultimately connected to the truth being delivered into the churches. We'll notice that we're going to look at Di Diotrephes today, that he is preventing these missionaries, these emissaries of John, from delivering the word of God to these churches. It's believed that these missionaries, these emissaries, Demetrius being one of them that's referred to in verse 12, are being sent out by John from Ephesus to the churches in that area to deliver his letters. And we'll talk more about what that means as we look at verse 9 in particular. But these letters are not being delivered to individuals. These men are not stopping along the way and dropping them off to John Christian on Smith Street or or, or, or Bob the Christian on Walnut Street, or, or, or Sally the Christian on whichever street. No, they're being delivered to churches that have pastors who will then preach what John has written, being received as the word of God. Significantly, these individuals are also helping these young churches establish themselves in the truth of the word. Now, that's a significant issue because at this point in time in church history, the Gnostics are in full bloom. At this point in the time of the church history, we're talking late 80s, early 90s AD, we have the Gnostics now uh, having developed their heresy fully, and it's really impacting the church. We saw forms of pre-Gnosticism in, in the church in Colossae when we studied the book of Colossians. 
and we saw the blending of certain pagan ideas and Judaism and syncretism and, and angel worship and a lot of other things, the diminishing of the work and person of Jesus Christ being supplanted by other things. And that's ultimately what is happening here too. We understand that from 2 John. It's also one of the reasons that we find that the gospel of John is so important because the Gnostics were attacking the sufficiency, the, 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 the person of Christ and his deity significantly. And the gospel of John establishes clearly and unequivocally the deity of Jesus Christ. That's one of its primary purposes. And so John is writing these letters and they're being sent out. And what happens is that there are individuals who then help with that endeavor. Gaius is one of them. And what we find then is that John communicates to us what it means to be hospitable as a Christian. What we then learn about Gaius is that he apparently is a man of means. He may have a church in his home or he may be affiliated with another church in the area. But what he is doing is that he's allowing these emissaries like Demetrius and others who are coming along to come into his home, to be fed, to be protected, to be clothed, to be financed in order to propagate this these letters, the word of God, to these churches to be delivered to the pastors and elders of these congregations so the people of God can be taught. So it's interesting to me that this is not an individual effort in the context of communicating to individuals, but rather communicating to the church so the saints, the holy ones, can be taught the word of God and instructed as to what it means to, believe, to be a Christian and what Christians believe. Notice that John is making frequent reference to the truth. The, 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 the truth. Well, the truth is what is being taught in the church. So this is a significant epistle for us, and we don't want to forget that. Well, last week we considered in verse 8 the idea of our participation in this endeavor. Verse 8 tells us that therefore we ought to support such men. That is a form of Christian hospitality, and it's the primary form of it, that sacrificial giving, if you will. Back then, as we know, Gaius would have invited these people in, fed them, clothed them, helped them, given them time to rest and to encourage them and to get them to where they needed to be in regard to delivering the letters that John had written to the churches. And so we ought to support those kinds of people engaged in that type of effort. We ought to be discerning and good steward of our resources as it relates to who it is that we support and why we support them. Are they committed to the truth? Are they consistent with their presentation of the gospel? Are they engaged in that endeavor? John indicates that so doing makes us partakers, fellow workers, if you will, with the truth, with the propagation of the gospel into the churches, the church being the repository, the guardian, the defender of the truth. That's the role of the church. That's what the church does. We don't entertain, we don't appease, we don't become a community center, we're not the Grange. I don't have anything against the Grange, but we're not the Grange. We're the body of Christ for whom Christ died, and we are here as the bride of Christ to be instructed in the way in which we ought to live and act and what we should believe about Jesus Christ, that is, the truth. And so we have here in verse 8 that significant uh, clause that a clause, if you will, there in the latter part of verse 8, so that we may be what? Fellow workers with the truth. Coming alongside these men, aiding them, those who are engaged in gospel ministry. This would include missionaries, pastors, and I would be cautious even about saying it would include certain um, parachurch organizations because what we find here in John is that this was going into the church. It is the church's responsibility. It is the church's obligation. Not that these others cannot aid and assist, but the primary obligation. And I fear even today that that role has been usurped. And as a consequence of that, the churches are less guarding the truth than they had in the past and ought to be more attentive to that and more engaged in that. And so John is very concerned about this. Now, the contrast. I, said you, I told you when we first began this epistle a few months back that there was going to be a contrast between two men. And we have that contrast now coming out for us, the contrast between Gaius and Diotrephes, whose name significantly means the son of Zeus, the offspring of Zeus. We have, Di we have Gaius, 
this godly spiritual man that John commends for living and walking in the truth, and we have Gaius, this man of the world who acts like the world and conducts himself like the world and uh, appropriately is named the son of Zeus. He's acting like a son of the world, like a child of the world. And John pulls no punches in dealing with him. So what we want to do then is begin to look at verse 9. John begins verse 9 with this little <laughs> statement. Um, I, I wrote something to the church. <laughs> okay, well, what is it, John? What did you write? Well, there is some debate about this in terms of the timing. It depends on when you see the book of 3 John being written. At a minimum, it contains 2 and 3 John. At a minimum, John is referring to this letter and the second, his second epistle. And he's referencing the idea that he was concerned about the issues that are coming into the church. If we go back to, to 2 John, we can find that he is concerned. And it's likely that the tension between John and Diotrephes is driven by Diotrephes giving in to the Gnostics and not wanting John to be too critical of them. And that he apparently is open to the ideas of the Gnostics and that he's allowing them to come into the church and he doesn't want a letter like 2 John coming into the church because it's going to drive the Gnostics away or it might cause followers of the Gnostics to not want to be a part of what is going on in that church. It is believed by some that Diotrephes may have had a church in his home as was the custom back then. Like we find with Philemon, like we find here with perhaps Gaius and now Diotrephes is in all likelihood involved in that type of dynamic with a group of people. And what we find then is that John had written, and then Diotrephes' response is to, as we'll see, to react very harshly and, and even violently, if you will, with regard to his actions towards those who would oppose him in that way. So when, uh, let's go back to 2 John just by way of reminder. John writes in verse 1 of 2 John, the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Now, the elder of the chosen lady, that's referring to a church. It's not a, it's not a woman with her children. It's, it's a metaphor, it's a symbol, if you will, a euphemism to communicate that he is referring to the church. Verse 2, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. There again, that significant issue regarding the truth. And here, look at, note, note what verse 2 says. For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So the truth is worth guarding. The truth is worth protecting. And he's concerned about those who would then give in and acquiesce and diminish the truth. Because the truth is connected to what? It's connected to who Jesus Christ is and what he did and why he did it and how we can know him and why we need him. That's a very important message. And if that message gets altered or is prevented, then people are deprived of opportunities to hear the word of God, which is the primary means by which God saves people, his elect. Verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from the Lord Je and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So here again, this is important. What we then find is that you can be lovingly intolerant, <laughs> if you will, because John has no room for people like Diotrephes. You don't compromise the truth. You don't appease. You don't give in. You don't allow them to have a foot in the door. And John is concerned about that because the truth is at stake. You don't allow it. And this is what this little epistle is about, ultimately. Verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers, now here's what's going on, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not, look what happens here, and this is, this is what Diotrephes is involved in. This is what Diotrephes is accommodating. 
it's interesting that there are some who try to turn this issue into a tit for tat between John and Diotrephes, that it's a power play on the part of John, that he feels threatened by Diotrephes, and that he needs to put Diotrephes in place because he doesn't want to be usurped. And that, that John is, is, is actually reacting harshly. There are those who take him to task over the content of 2 John and the content of what he says in 3 John about Diotrephes. Oh, it's not loving, it's not kind. That type of thing. It's really unbelievable the perspective that some have about these two epistles and the, and the condemnation that is leveled against John for what some perceive to be a, too harsh of a response to what Diotrephes is doing. Well, I think John is spot on. And by the way, these are inspired by the Holy Spirit, so I think we're okay in, in that way. John says, for many deceivers... So that's important. Many deceivers. There is deception that is going on. Remember in Colossae, Paul warns the, the believers in Colossae that the false teacher who was in their midst was persuasive, that he was a silver-throated orator, that he had a way of convincing people that he was, in fact, deceptive. And we, as the redeemed of Christ, need to be perceptive about the deception that is going on. That what comes into the church needs to be tested, needs to be looked at, not to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. But to be testing these things, to see if they are, what, true. Truth is measured by Scripture. And so we see here then in verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. That's Gnosticism. The Gnostics taught that, that there had to be a separation between the body of Christ and his spirit because the body was corrupt. You couldn't join a Holy Spirit with a, with a, a, a decayed, unholy body. It, 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 was, it was a mess. And there were variations on that theme as well that came out of all of that nonsense. But you see here the fundamental problem. So look what it says again. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh... When you don't acknowledge him as coming in the flesh, he can't be your savior. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of the gospel. We didn't sacrifice a, a, a dog on the cross or a cow or a lamb or a horse. No, it was Jesus the man. It had to be that way. It had to be that way. And this is what the Gnostics are attacking. And so Diotrephes, let's keep in mind the significance of what's happening here. For me to understand John's words in verses 9 and 10 and 11, I need to understand what John's talking about here in 2 John, verse 7 and following. So we understand the nature of the attack, the content of what Diotrephes is giving into. John goes on to identify this type of teaching and those who promulgate it as the following. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. This is of Satan. That's what he's saying. This is of the devil. And that's what the devil would do, right? The devil is always attacking the sufficiency of the work and person of Jesus Christ, correct? He wants you to think the deception is that you must have something other than Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And oh, it just happens to always be more of you. Right? That's the deception. So verse 8. Importantly, John says what? Watch yourselves. So be on the guard. That you do not lose what we have accomplished. That you may receive a full reward. Don't fall away from the teaching. It's the same warning that we find in Hebrews as it relates to the exhortations there. Look at verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So what I know right away is that Christians are going to believe and say things that are consistent with the Word of God. When that is gone... The likelihood is that they are not believers. Now, are we going to say that Diotrephes was not a believer? Most commentators believe that he was, and that's why John holds out the hope that his, his going to him and meeting with him in person would cause him to come back, that he would repent, that he would return, if you will, from his sin and departure from the teachings of the word of God. 
And so there's some hope that Diotrephes is a believer. I believe that to be the case, especially in light of the fact that in all possibility he was hosting a, home, a church in his home and that he had been engaged in ministry at some level up to this point in time at a significant level that he was able to excommunicate people from a church. Perhaps he was even the pastor of a church. That's possible. So it says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. This means that there's measurement. There's an assessment of the content of what a person is saying, what they're teaching, what they hold to, what their doctrine is, what the source of it is. This is a calling to the pew. This is what the people in the pew do with regard to what is being said. It is up to the pew to make certain that the truth is being preached from the pulpit. Wait a minute. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. So this speaks to what we know to be the case at this point in time. These emissaries, these missionaries, well, apparently there were Gnostic missionaries. There are Gnostic emissaries who would come along and, and they would take advantage of some of the people who were hosting those who were delivering John's letters and going into the churches, they would come along as if they were kind of part of that. Remember, they're deceivers. They're part of that deception. And John is warning them and saying, don't, don't allow these people to come in. Don't be hospitable to them. Don't extend yourself to them in that way. Don't facilitate the promulgation of the error. Because it's a big error. Don't do that. The application today would be, don't support organizations or churches that are communicating error, who are not teaching the whole counsel of God. This is why you have to be careful about the missionaries that you pick, the pastors that you have, that type of thing. So we find out that there's a standard. For the one, verse 11, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Wow, that's significant. You know, an accessory to the fact. That's even the law works that way. If you go with somebody to rob a store and you drive it, you're an accessory, even though you didn't go in and pull the gun and steal the chips and rob the cashier. It's as if the law says that it's just as if you were in there with them. And the guy who drove the car goes to prison as long as the guy who had the gun and stole the chips. So this is the point. This is, so, this is, so you have context now, right? We want to make sure we understand. So when I then go to these verses, I understand the background. What's interesting, too, is that when John refers to the brethren, he's referring to the people who are identified in verses 4 through 6. He writes as follows, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just if you receive commandment to do from the Father. These are the people that Diotrephes is impacting. These are the same people that Gaius is attempting to facilitate through the delivery of John's letters through these missionaries and emissaries. These are the people that Demetrius is trying to get to to deliver John's letters. Now, as I said, the, many believe that what's being delivered is 2nd and 3rd John. There are some commentators who believe it's also the Gospel of John, which in many ways makes sense because of the growing error and heresy of the Gnostics, that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John would pen then his, his great opus magnus, magnus, if you will, with regard to the deity of the work and person of Jesus Christ. John's gospel is uniquely different from uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in its focus as it relates to who Jesus Christ is and his deity. So, it's possible. We're not going to be dogmatic about that. What we do know is that John is writing, and he's writing to the churches, and John as the apostle, that Diotrephes would have understood and knew. He knows, he knows who John is. They're not strangers to each other. John's no stranger in the area. He's very well known. He's got a significant footprint in that area. He's lived in that area for a lengthy period of time. He's connected to Ephesus and all of that went on there. And so Diotrephes would have known who he was. And it would have been anticipated that because he was an apostle, 
that there would have been some deference given, but Diotrephes doesn't do that. And so in verse 9, we find that John says, I wrote something to the church. So we have a sense then of what that is. The content of what he writes is to counter what the Gnostics are saying. Second John, third John. And that's significant. Again, notice the recipient. Notice the recipient. It's not a letter to Gaius. It's not a letter to uh, an individual group of people. It's not a letter to a, to a small group. It's a letter to a church, to the churches. I wrote something to the church. That's important. Again, why the church? Because the church is the repository, defender, and proclaimer of the truth. Church is a big deal. Church is a big deal. Verse 9, but Diotrephes. Oh boy. Here we go. We find out right out of the gate the man's got a problem. He's very prideful. He wants preeminence. Um, he wants to be first. That's a problem. He, right out of the gate, begins to demonstrate his inadequacy to serve in any capacity, in any church, in any position. This, this doesn't work in any context. Whether it's a pastor, an elder, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, whatever. This doesn't work. We understand that Diotrephes loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. So he's prideful and unteachable. Wow. That's a problem. Prideful and unteachable. He does not accept what we say. John is referring to himself and those who are delivering these letters, someone like Demetrius or perhaps even Gaius, those who are standing in the whole counsel of God and committed to the truth, Diotrephes, is opposed to them, all of them. And so his opposition is significant. He loves to be first among them and does not accept what we say. And for this reason, he says, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. Now, we've got a whole category of problems here, but I think what is significant is that there is a model here that is, I think, in many ways neglected often in the church and within evangelicalism as it relates to identifying those who are in error and not being afraid to do so. Because what is at stake is of eternal consequence. Eternal consequence. Diotrephes is impacting the church. He has a consequence. He's impacting the growth of the redeemed. He's impacting their maturity. He's impacting their assurance. He's impacting the sufficiency of the work and person of Jesus Christ. He's undermining the authority of other pastors and elders within their church. And he's giving place to an error be, that is the progeny, if you will, of Satan himself. That's significant. And of course... These are the types of people that Satan can use in the church to rip it apart, who loves to be first and is not teachable. Prideful, unteachable. An unteachable spirit is a real problem. If you can't be taught, that's a, that's a significant issue. I think it's significant, too, that Jerry Bridges, in his little book, Respectable Sins, identifies an unteachable spirit as a sin that a lot of people put up with in the church and ought not to. The idea that, that you can't be taught anything, that you're going to reject anything that's delivered from the pulpit or taught in the context of opening God's word, that you are the ultimate and final arbiter of all that is true, and that you just reject stuff. You have an unteachable spirit. You won't receive instruction. You won't receive exhortation. You won't receive a rebuke. You won't receive any type of grounding in the word of God. That's a problem. It's such a problem that it becomes disruptive to the church and impedes the role and purpose of the church as the repository, defender, and proclaimer of the truth. How big of a deal is this? I'll show you how big of a deal it is. Turn to Romans. 
what we find here then is what John is doing is he's exercising what we're called to do in the book of Romans by Paul in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Verses 17 through 18. Paul writing here again, instruction to these folks who are in churches. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings which you learned. There again, that, that, that idea of not allowing people to corrupt or, or impede the proclamation and growth in the church. Notice the, con- notice the words that Paul uses. Hindrances, dissensions. And hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. Turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. Now, that's interesting because John makes a similar exhortation and comment in verse 11 about what is good and what is evil and the sources of those things. And so we see a a consistent theme. John is acting consistently with Paul's exhortation Perhaps, and I would believe that John had read Romans 16. And in all likelihood, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these things are being called back into his own mind, having read this, understanding it, looking at it. And the significance of this for the church, again, in regards to what the purpose of the church is and how zealous you ought to be in regards to defending it. Now, people will say, well, that's not loving. That's not very kind can't we just get along and just, maybe they have some good things to say. No, look what happens. We, there's no quarter given. Paul refers to these types of men as slaves, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. Their own appetites. We see that to be the case with who? With Diotrephes. This one who would spread dissension, who would spread discord, who would reject the truth, is not teachable. We understand from Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, that the Lord hates those who spread discord among the brethren. It's an abomination. Why? Because it attacks the church. What is the church? It's the bride of Christ. What is the bride of Christ doing? Communicating and preaching to the saints. To do what? To build them up, to purify, to be involved in gospel proclamation. We also find then that in regards to the uh, role of one who is involved, that Diotrephes' behavior is inconsistent with that as well. Look at Titus chapter 3 with me. Again, Paul writing here to Titus, a young pastor. Titus chapter 3, verse 10, reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Now, there is some grace given. And I think John has given Diotrephes even grace. He's written the letter. He's going to go to him. He wants to speak to him and talk to him about these things. So there is grace given, but, but it's, it's a short rope, if you will. It's not grace that leads to concession. Either there's going to be repentance and restoration or they're out. That's the bottom line. 
The word reject is significant. Do not associate with, separate yourselves from a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. That goes back to that appetite, that thing that they're pursuing that's of coming out of themselves, their own wicked hearts that way. Paul also writing to Titus here in chapter 1 with regard to the qualifications of those who are involved in church leadership, which this is important for us to consider with regard to Diotrephes, who apparently is involved in some level of leadership. He writes in a similar way to Timothy, Verse 5 of chapter 1, Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. <clears throat> Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of disp dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Look at this, what he says, because he kind of contrasts in those who might be involved in the church in some way, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. He gives an example of what one of them said. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. <laughs> I don't think we have any Cretans in the congregation, but nonetheless, uh, you would not like to be called that. And this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Notice again the guarding. Notice again the importance of what is going on in the church and the efforts of the church to protect itself from these types of people. And the consequences of not doing so can be devastating. And so back in 3 John, we have a better understanding now of why John is so concerned about what Diotrephes is doing. And here in verse 9, we already have his character cast in a very deficient way. This is not a man who in any context would be allowed to be engaged in any form of leadership in the church, ought not to have been, not qualified, disqualified, frankly, because of what we know about him. And so right out of the gate, we understand then the problem, and we see then that John is teaching us, and he's teaching Gaius how it is that such people ought to be dealt with. A person who loves to be first and does not accept is not teachable in any way. We'll have more to say about that in verse 10 next week. We're going to leave it there, but I want to leave you with this idea of how significant the gospel is, how important it is. Do you, do you understand what God's word says? Do you understand the content of it? Do you understand the gospel? You must in order to prevent yourself from becoming subject to this type of error. People can be easily deceived, easily led astray, and sadly, have their eyes taken off of Christ, which is what we do not want. The church's primary obligation is to proclaim the truth. And the truth is all about Jesus Christ. If that's not the priority of the church, if the priority of the church is entertainment or program or other things, then the church has lost its focus, it's lost sight, and it will not be able to defend itself against error. This is why you see so much of it today in the church teachings that are just, quite frankly, mind-boggling in many ways and ought not to be in the church. So this exhortation is timely, it's helpful, and I trust it's an encouragement to you to be more attentive and understanding of what the truth is because ultimately you would have to be the person that would say, wait a minute, where is Christ? Where is, is he preaching Christ? Do we hear about Jesus Christ? How often does he say his name? How often does he open the word? How often does he point us to Jesus Christ? We need to hear about Christ, and that's what we are here for today. That's why we assemble together. That's why we don't forsake ourselves from assembling together, especially when we see the day approaching. That is the time 
when the consummation of all things, as we've been studying in the book of Revelation, the finality of all of that, that is coming. And I trust that we appreciate these warnings and exhortations. Lord, we love you. Thank you for Third John. Thank you for giving us this clear instruction. Thank you for the clarity that John brings to this issue. Help us to be mindful of the purpose and role of the church. Help us to learn a lesson from the individuals that we are looking at here in Third John. Help us to guard our hearts against the tendencies that we have to fall into these kinds of traps. Help us to guard our hearts against pride, to be, uh, a, 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 be used as a bludgeon and to also keep us from being taught. I pray, Lord, that you would give us all teachable hearts that would cause us to be humble. We understand that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And Christ was humble, a humble servant. Help us to have that same servant heart as we serve others in the church, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.